In the early 20th century, we were beginning to understand this process of, of emission and absorption of radiation from atoms. So I can shoot light at an atom and it will absorb very, very specific wavelengths of light, or I can heat up elements and, and they will give off very specific wavelengths of light. And, and we were getting an understanding of this uh, very early on through something called the Bohr model, which is um, not an accurate picture, but it's the beginning like the first step towards an accurate picture. And in the Bohr model, you have the electrons whizzing around. They look like tiny little planets orbiting their little nucleus. And somehow it became like the default symbol for science, especially physics. I don't know how, because it's an incorrect model. Anyway, different episode. But we started to notice something funny with these uh, emission lines. That the, It wouldn't be just one specific wavelength that would be emitted at a specific energy level. Sometimes they would get split and, and, and there'd be tiny little differences. So instead of one kind of wavelength of light emitted, it was actually two very, very close uh, wavelengths of light. That if you look far away, it's just one line, but then if you look at it in fine detail, you get two different lines. And we call this a fine splitting or the fine structure of atomic lines. And we realized that what we needed to account for this, uh, to explain this fine structure, was introducing more sophisticated versions of quantum mechanics, basically. Uh, over the course of a few years, uh, we, we introduced a better understanding of quantum mechanics. Uh, we introduced the concept of spin, which is critical to understanding this kind of splitting. And in the equations, as we were starting to understand the relationship between charged particles and electromagnetic radiation, uh, a constant appeared. This constant it was called the fine structure constant because it was originally applied to understanding the fine structure of uh, emission and absorption spectra. Uh, and like, okay, a constant, that's not big of a deal. Who cares? There are constants everywhere in nature, and pretty much any time you're trying to describe any sort of physical situation whatsoever, some sort of constant shows up, some sort of number that describes how strong an effect is, or, or how f frequent an effect is, or, or just whatever. Our universes, or our mathematical models of the universe, is littered with constants, and so at first, the appearance of the fine structure constant uh, just wasn't that big of a deal. But then time went on and we started to see the fine structure constant appear uh, more and more often. It wasn't just in this one very narrow case of the fine structure constant oh, having to do with the strength of a certain splitting. Uh, it started to show up in other places. Like for example, if you take that Bohr model, which again is not accurate, but it's a good starting place. If you put an electron in its lowest energy orbital around an atomic nucleus, the lowest energy it can possibly have, and you calculate the speed, you pretend it's a little planet whizzing around and you calculate its speed, and you take that and divide it by the speed of light, you get to find structure constant. Or take two electrons put them a certain distance apart. And then you calculate the energy you would need to overcome their electrostatic repulsion and push them together. That's a certain amount of energy. And then you take the energy of a photon with the wavelength of two pi times that same distance. Uh, you take the ratio and you get the, the fine structure constant. If you, if you take the energy of an electron in its lowest energy orbital in an atomic nucleus, in hydrogen, and you compare that to its rest mass energy as provided by special relativity, you know, E equals mc squared, all that, you get the fine structure constant squared. And that's just scratching the surface. Like any time we were investigating the relationship between charged particles and electromagnetic radiation, the fine structure constant would just show up and say, hey guys, hey, hey, how's it, how, how's everyone doing? I'm glad you discovered me. Uh, here I am. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm telling you something important and fundamental about the relationship between charged particles and electromagnetic radiation. But what exactly is the fine structure constant telling us? Fundamentally, fundamentally, it's easy to say what the fine structure constant is. It's the strength of the coupling between charged particles and 
electromagnetic radiation. It tells you about that relationship. And, it's, and in that sense, it's not any different than any other constant. Like Newton's G tells us about the fundamental uh, strength of the gravitational interaction. You know, the speed of light tells us about the fundamental speed of light, of, of causality in our universe. Uh, there, are there are constants just everywhere that tell us about these relationships the fine structure constant isn't any different in that regard. It's just telling us, okay, charged particles talk to the electromagnetic field or electromagnetic radiation. Uh, this comes with a certain amount of strength and, and this is provided by the fine structure constant. What's weird, or there's a couple weird things about the fine structure constant. One is it's dimensionless. All the other constants that we have or many of the other constants that we have, have, have units associated with them. Uh, uh, meters, uh, seconds, uh, kilograms, uh, just whatever. And so the actual value of those constants doesn't matter. Like the speed of light. You can have the speed of light, the number that is the speed of light can be anything it wants because it really depends on the units. If I say, oh, the speed of light is around 300 million kilometers per second. Okay, well, it only has that number because I decided how long a kilometer is and how long a second is. If I change my definition of second, if I change my definition of kilometer, if I say, no, 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 kilometers are this big and a second is that long, then that will change that number. And so the number itself is meaningless because it's all, it's all dependent on the units. But the fine structure constant is different. The fine structure constant is unitless. It's dimensionless. And this suggests that the number itself has importance, that it has meaning, uh, because it, it doesn't come from uh, our standardization of the universe. It, it just appears in, in the value of the fine structure constant. Originally, when we were studying this in the early 20th century, we thought it had exactly the value one divided by 137. One over 137, like 0.08, blah, 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 blah. 137, that seems like such an odd number. I mean, it's literally an odd number, but, but I mean, like of, of all the numbers it could possibly be for this, for this constant of coupling between electromagnetic radiation and charged particles, why this number? Why 137? Why not 24? Why not 2 pi? Why not 6 billion? Why not 10 to the minus 43? Why 137? That's such an odd number. Odd choice. It seemed weird and it struck early physicists and it still strikes us today. Uh, and they became obsessed with, or many scientists became obsessed with, with trying to understand this number because it didn't depend on units. It was just like the fine structure constant just showed up and said, I am one over 137. Where does that come from? Uh, Sir Arthur Eddington, the famous physicist who tested uh, relativity, brilliant scientist, uh, he convinced himself that the number of protons in the universe was 137 times 2 to the power of 256. And so he's like, yeah, uh, there's 137 appearing in the number of protons, and then there's 137 appearing in the fine structure constant. Bingo. It doesn't make any sense. It's weird and it's frustrating. Uh, it turns out it's not exactly 137 or 1 over 137. And so any attempts to explain the number 137 are just going to fail because it's not exactly 137. And it's also not exactly constant. Well, uh, the fine structure constant is constant in the sense it's, it's the same throughout all of space and time. Uh, and we've really, really measured this. Um, anytime there's an interaction between charged particles and electromagnetic radiation, the fine structure constant is involved because it's telling us how strong that coupling is, how strong that relationship is, how much chemistry there is in that relationship. And charged particles and electromagnetic radiation have been uh, playing around with each other for billions of years and over the course of billions of light years. So we can measure like polarization to distant light sources across the universe. We can look at the cosmic microwave background. Uh, we can look at all sorts of things. And as far as we can tell, the fine structure constant is the same throughout the universe and has been throughout the history of the universe. Uh, because if it was different, it would change the physics and then that would break the observations that we see. But the fine structure constant does change with energy.
And to understand this, we have to we have to take a step back and we have to talk about quantum field theory. Do you guys just put the word quantum in front of everything? Quantum field theory is what happens when you take quantum mechanics and marry it to special relativity, and then they make a baby called quantum field theory. Quantum field theory replaces all of our notions of particles you know, bouncing around doing their thing with fields. These fields inhabit the entire universe. They soak space and time like, like vinegar and olive oil soaking a nice crusty piece of bread. Uh, in all these fields, there's one field for every kind of entity. So there's the electromagnetic field. There is a electron field. There is a top quark field. There is a tau neutrino field. There's a field for everybody. It's like the Oprah here. You get a field and you get a field and you get a field. And all these fields interact with each other. What we see is particles are just local uh, excitations or vibrations of the field. So a photon is just a piece of the electromagnetic field. An electron is just a piece of the electron field. And all these fields talk to each other. And the fine structure constant, of course, appears here because it's telling us how strongly uh, the charge in, say, the electron field, how strongly it connects to the electromagnetic field. How, how strong is that relationship? The annoying thing about quantum field theory is that all fields participate in all interactions. If, if I have, say, an electron, bouncing off of a photon, the picture is much more complicated than that because the other fields get to participate in that reaction. They, they, they get to be a part of it in a very, very subtle way. At low energies, we can largely ignore that and we can just talk about electron, photon, what is their interaction like? What is the fine structure constant? But at high energies, other fields participate in the interaction. It's not just an electron and a photon meeting. Uh, there's like a little gluon involved or a little, little neutrino pops out and then disappears back into the vacuum. Uh, the interaction becomes much more complicated at high energies. And so the fine structure constant, which measures the relationship between electrons and uh, electromagnetic radiation, changes. And we've actually observed this. We've actually measured it. At high energies, the fine structure constant has a different value than it does at low energies. And, and so we say, we say the fine structure constant uh, runs. It changes its value with energy. I'm pretty tired. We don't know where it's running to. We don't know its ultimate value. We don't know, we don't have a theory of unified physics. We, we don't know what happens to the nature of forces and interactions at the very highest energy scales. So we don't know what the fine structure constant will look like at the ultimate highest energies. And, well, we basically have no explanation for the fine structure constant. The constant appears in our equations, whether we're studying the splitting of spectral lines or we're looking at the quantum field theory interactions of electrons and electromagnetic radiation. radiation the, the, the constant appears, but the value doesn't. The constant shows up and says, yes, there is a strength, a relationship here between these fields. But we don't know what that number is without measuring it. We have to go out into the world and perform experiments and then plug the answer back in. So like in the case of the splitting of spectral lines, we can develop a theory that tells us how the spectral lines split and that, yay! But it doesn't tell us how much because it depends on the fine structure constant. So we have to go out and then measure the splitting, the amount of splitting, and then work backwards and then fill in the gap for the actual value. And the theory works and is still predictive because it tells us that the splitting has happened, but we have to tune the amount of splitting based on the fine structure constant. And this has been the case for every single place where the fine structure constant appears. There is no way to know the value of the fine structure constant without going out and measuring it. And so it's doubly weird. One, because it has no units, no dimensions. It's just a number. And two, we have to measure this number in the universe. Our own theory of physics, theories of physics, don't tell us what the number should be. We would like to explain it because it seems fundamental, especially because it's, it's not tied to any, any standardization, any measurement scheme of the universe. There are no dimensions, there are no units. It's just a number that appears in our theories. And we would like to know where it comes from. Why does it have the value that it does? Is there any way to get it without doing an experiment so far? No.
string theory uh, or a generic theory of everything would hope to provide it. You would write, you know, have your strings interacting in a multi-dimensional universe, blah, 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 and just says, here is your fine structure constant with this value. String theory is incomplete and might be wrong. Uh, maybe this is telling us, uh, telling us about the multiverse, like there are different universes, universes with, with different, different physical realities, realities different, different values of the fine structure, structure constant. constant. If you were to change the value of the fine structure constant, our universe would look completely different. Atoms would be different sizes. Chemistry would be way different. Life may be impossible. And so you might say, well, we have this value of the fine structure constant because if it were a different value, life would be impossible and we wouldn't be here to observe it. So of course it has this value because we're here to see this value. That's called the anthropic argument. It's not the greatest argument. We're honestly a little bit stuck. We don't know why the fine structure constant has this value. Our theories of physics do not tell us. We can only measure it. It seems to be important. It seems to be very, very critical to our understanding of reality, and yet we don't know why it has the value that it does. So maybe that's all we're ever going to know about the fine structure constant. Hopefully, uh, a theory of unified physics at higher energy scales will tell us what the value is, and maybe we can get some origins for it. And maybe not. Either way, we, we have to live with it which I know is kind of a bummer way to end an episode, but, but that's all we got, folks. Thank you so much for watching. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Go to patreon.com slash pmsutter so that you can keep this show going. I really do appreciate it, and I'll see you next time.